This is a Digital Music Trans episode 153, recorded on the 9th of October 2013. This week on the show, the BBC launches the playlister, HMV makes plans, Move Music reaches 2 million subscribers, NARM and DigitalMusic.org become the Music Business Association, Splice gets funding for music collaboration tools, the LSE paper on copyright and creation causes controversy, and lots more. This week's show is sponsored by media law firm Sheridan's at sheridans.co.uk. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Linelli and this is a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available as audio and video on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcasters, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. To get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at DigiMusicTrends or email us on contact at DigitalMusicTrends.com and if you have been listening to the show for a while and never got in touch, why not do it right now? Uh, grab your phone or open up a tab in your browser and uh, uh, shoot an email to contact at digitalmusictrans.com. I'd love to hear who you are and uh, what you're up to. And this week, it's a real pleasure to have on the show Emmanuel Lucan, a freelance journalist and media consultant with a past experience as a global, global editor at Billboard, uh, as well as editor-in-chief at Music and Media. Emmanuel is also conference director at the World Creators Summit. So hi, Emmanuel. How's it going today? Hi, Andrea. It's fine. Uh, greetings from Los Angeles, where the weather is a bit gray. Well, you know, it's just tough, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, someone has to do it. Someone has to do it, exactly. And it's also a great pleasure uh, to uh, have on the show uh, Rob McAllister, who is a digital marketing expert working at Music Alley, where he also co-edits uh, the digital-oriented publication Sandbox. So hi, Rob, and great to have you on. How's it going? Thank you very much. been very busy today with uh, Sandbox going out today, but hopefully... Hopefully, uh, it will all go out with uh, no problems whatsoever. That's great. Well, thanks so much for making the time. And uh, we start this week by talking about the BBC, since uh, uh, today it uh, launched a new service uh, called the Playlister, uh, which a company claims will transform uh, people's relationship with music, at least as far as the BBC experience is concerned. So uh, phase one of the new service uh, was rolled out today and is a browser browser only experience, uh, although there's also a Spotify app that has been released. And so uh, what does that do? what does it do essentially you know it lets people tag and create playlists from the music they hear on the bbc channels so these playlists can then be expanded with recommendations from djs for example and most importantly they can be exported to third-party services for listening in full Uh, and launch partners are these are spotify and youtube so uh, three pretty big players in the in this uh, uh, streaming arena and the playlister will not be limited to the uk but uh, the ambitions of the bbc is to have it uh, rolled out worldwide and work worldwide which is an interesting uh, thing because it helps further the brand of the BBC as well in terms of content uh, because it it's been doing extremely well uh, also in the United States for example and uh, you know it's a, it's a very interesting concept you know uh, the, the operation is pretty simple they just have a playlist or, uh, tag in most uh, radio station channels um, and you can just uh, playlist a specific track that is playing right now and then it gets added to the list. Uh, that list you can then recall and you can uh, export it to a, a streaming service of your choice. So uh, it seems pretty cool. Uh, you know, it's a very forward thinking move from the BBC and this is only the very start of a long term initiative. So uh, Rob, what are your feelings about this? And, and uh, uh, did you expect the BBC to come out with something quite so, so uh, thought out on the music front? I think, to be honest, I wasn't necessarily expecting something um, which was so vast with yeah. their with their aims. But I think it obviously sticks to the BBC's image of making sure they don't tie in with one service. I am quite surprised that audio hasn't really been included in those services mm. at the moment from the press releases I've seen. Um, and Deezer maybe has. Um, maybe that shows that it's more orientated towards Europe um, than RDO, obviously, which is more, more US, I guess. Um, but I think it, it will have a lot of power in raise an awareness of these other third-party services. Obviously, it's tied in with YouTube, which makes it accessible by billions of people. Um, but it also does promote the other sort of your legal streaming services where or subscription services as well. Um, I think it could also have... I'm a massive fan of, of the BBC, as I think pretty much anyone who English is. Um, we're very proud of the Beeb. But I think the marketing power that it has, especially when it comes to breaking new acts with something like BBC introducing, could also be quite interesting for DIY bands. And, you know, one of the big things is constantly how do new artists get reach on services like Spotify, Deezer, RDO. Um, and this could be one way how you can piggyback off, you know, if Zane Lowe plays your record, all of a sudden you're in a playlist automatically or you, your song is highlighted um, in front of millions of people. 
Yeah, absolutely. And Emmanuel, this is uh, interesting because uh, uh, you know you're you're coming from SF Music Tech, uh, uh, where I think a lot of the talk around streaming services were around curation, and this is the ultimate curation tool because you know the BBC DJs are renowned worldwide for being great taste makers. So it's a great filter, right? I guess so. I haven't seen the service yet, but um, uh, if it's as good as the iPlayer, uh, there, you know, and it's you have the BBC brand. I cannot see it fail. Uh, as you say, they have that, uh, you know, it's a recognized brand when it comes to new talent. And uh, indeed, one of the, the, the main complaints was, that was made uh, during the SF Music Tech when it came to mu uh, streaming services was that they actually they were not personalized enough and also the recommendation tools were absolutely dreadful. And uh, it, the BBC coming from that editorial perspective and having that depth of music also that they play on all the different channels, I'm sure that that can, on a global basis, can uh, be a game changer for introducing new talent. And, and I welcome that. Yeah, and and an interesting thing that actually I was talking to the people that have uh, sort of built uh, this today. I was at the unveiling at the BBC this morning, and they were talking about the fact that one of the biggest challenges is to actually aggregate all the metadata so that uh, this service works across the board. And that's the, that was very interesting because for them, you know, the the big challenge was to get the back, you know, the back office part right and make sure that everything worked and that the playlists that they were linking into these third party streaming services were also matching up to the to the to the correct tracks for example you know you wouldn't want uh, uh, you know uh, the track to be then uh, linked to a karaoke version on spotify instead of the of the real master so that's a whole set of challenges that, that i think was pretty must have been pretty difficult to solve uh, but uh, but robert uh, in terms of djs uh, uh, zane low was there he was super excited about this and uh, also in terms of the, the way that he's going to interact with the audience, do you think that this is going to spur a bit more interaction between the radio, uh, radio station itself and the audience in terms of uh, uh, understanding what people react to? A, a bit like Shazam in a way that in a way that people, if lots of people are playlisting this track, then it, m it must mean that there's something there, there's an attraction there. I'm sure they'll use it for some sort of curation for their playlists. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting that you may mention Zane Lowe, because I remember... He launched with, he was one of the main curators when Mflow launched. Right. And you think, sort of, where is Mflow now? I know it's sort of expanded into, I think, Bloom, uh, Bloom FM. But I remember very, very quickly he was one of the biggest influences, but it, it obviously didn't last very long. So I wonder, I do personally wonder how much we really respond on digital services to. Uh, curators such as, as radio presenters. I think a lot of people, there is a huge amount of value personally in listening to you know, Zane Lowe say why he loves a record, yeah. why he dislikes a record, where you won't be able to put that in um, in a playlist. And I, I know Spotify has, has been doing it in Sweden, I think, with a, a very big radio presenter. I don't know his name. And they've been sort of providing the sort of uh, the information around the tracks of why it's playlisted. Until it sort of gets to that, I, I sort of I'm, I'm not too sure, not too sold of on uh, on how popular it will be. But yeah. Topsify and, and I think Britify are very very popular. I've I've got lots of friends that follow the playlists and they follow the BBC Six Music's playlist every week. So I'm sure it will have a huge amount of traction as of tomorrow. Yeah, and as I was saying, I think it's a building block. So I, I think right now it's only launched with a Spotify app and then it's an in-browser experience. And mm. I don't know just how many people are going to be using the in-browser experience right now. I mean, it's really going to take off when they start integrating this in the iPlayer radio app, mm. app and eventually potentially even in the iPlayer video app so that you can tag music that's playing in the background of programs. I mean, that's going to be really the big play on, on, on this front. I think like right now it's going to probably be an early adopters tool, uh, but I, I just don't know how many people in the mainstream are going to bother or are used to the experience of going to the radio station's website and noticing that there's a small button that they can click and then doing mm. that and then uh, going from there. But, you know, as a long-term strategy, it's pretty interesting. Uh, Emmanuel, I want to ask you, as far as labels are concerned, do you think that uh, they're ha they'll be happy about this, you know, just in terms of exposure that artists can get and direct linking into into streaming services? Or would they rather uh, there, there be some, some links into, into more uh, substantial uh, means of income for them as well? <laughs> Well, I think there's a bit of, of both. Uh, you, you, probably the promo department will be very happy. The uh, the legal department will look at that with you know uh, more contracts to draft and you know uh, more streams of uh, income to uh, to double check and triple check. So that's that's probably going to be one of the 
the complications of that, especially if it's a global uh, tool. That having all the licensing in place must have been uh, some sort of a legal nightmare. Well, I but, guess the li licensing is left to the third-party services. Like the BBC doesn't have any licenses for the for the tracks. Uh, it's just a metadata question of moving metadata from one place to the other, and then just making sure that the service that you give it to has the the legal license to play that music. I guess. Well, that, that sounds like a smart way of doing it rather than starting, you know, all over again, you know, and, and <laughs> the deals in place. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bit like Rob, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, global tools are not necessarily uh, always the most efficient ones because uh, people want uh, something to be localized. But when it comes to the BBC and the, the, the reference that it means, you know, I, I remember being in, in, a, in a car somewhere in New Jersey and someone was was listening to the the chart show on on a Sunday, you know, and so it's like, well, New Jersey, BBC, that's an interesting mix, you know. You, I'm sure there are people in Australia who also do that, and so uh, it, it you will people will switch on because it's the the BBC, and they will they will probably try it or a certain level of the group of population will try it. Then, you know, I don't know how much scale they want. I don't know how much traction they want. You know, what, you know, have they mentioned, you know, what, you know, what would they use as a measurement for success? Yeah, uh, you know, what, what are, you know, so is it, you know, having one person in every single country in the world, their, their, their goal, or, you know, is there something more to that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think that's going to be interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm hoping that uh, in the next few weeks they're going to start releasing some num some numbers about uh, how how the initiative is going and and mm. where it's going as well uh, with more integrations and potentially, like uh, as, as Rob was mentioning, there's there's going to have to be more services that come into play. Uh, Ardu being a prime example of a service that has a pretty open API policy, so it'd be interesting. Like, I, I wouldn't see a reason why they wouldn't be on board with this. Uh, uh, so yeah, we're just going to have to wait and see, I guess. Well, the irony is, yesterday I was on the phone with someone from RDO and uh, and didn't mention that, so it was uh, it was a bit disappointed. <laughs> but if I had I known that, actually, I would probably have asked a question. But uh, it, it is interesting. Going back to the BBC, uh, it's fascinating. Um, uh, uh, Intel, the chip manufacturer, is uh, moving into the content side, but from the audiovisual right. sector, they want to create something that will probably uh, compete with Netflix in the US. Their benchmark for the new service is the BBC iPlayer, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Mm. So uh, that really means that uh, it looks like the BBC got it right with the iPlayer. So there is, uh, there is a lot of respect in the, in the tech community for what they've done. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic product and uh, everybody who's in the UK enjoys it. And I think a lot of Americans also who use VPNs to access it here in the UK enjoy it. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, and yeah, so uh, well, moving on from uh, uh, the BBC, I wanted to chat briefly about uh, HMV. So, uh, you know, we were chatting last week with a New Yorker about the arrival of the new Rough Trade store in Brooklyn and how excited everybody was there. And uh, But HMV is definitely a company that needs a bit of the Rough Trade magic at the moment. Uh, so, in, in a week, uh, uh, this week there was an interesting move uh, by the boss of the Hilco Group that acquired HMV, uh, which is uh, Paul McGowan. Uh, he addressed uh, what needs to be done at the company, not in the Financial Times, but in NME, which is a kind of a weird platform, but I, I guess he's trying to reach out to that uh, demographic and he listed five ways in which a company can improve and hopefully turn around its fortunes and these uh, are improving the stock relaunching the digital store increasing the number of uh, FOP stores which is great news for me uh, bringing in store uh, bringing more in-store gigs uh, and uh, listening to local stores so that the stock reflects uh, uh, the local scenes so so this, these are all good objectives I think uh, but uh, w you know just a quick comment on wh what do you reckon HMV can do, can it instigate a bit of that uh, rough trade magic and uh, and start getting people into stores again, uh, or is what is being done uh, just a bit of a, you know, a pipe dream roadmap that uh, uh, hasn't got a real outlet for implementation? Uh, Rob, what are your thoughts on this? I think like you, Andre, you know, I love FOP. I was a big, big fan. I go to the one just off, I think it's Piccadilly Circus yeah, I love that. quite a lot. Um, and I think they get a lot of things right. They have a huge vinyl collection now which stocks old stuff and new stuff they have a very fixed price and although the prices have increased i think after the acquisition of of hmv but you know the whole feel of the buying experience in fop is quite independent and it's also quite nice you still have some sort of staff curation and um, i'm sure it isn't but it feels like when you go in that 
each each member of staff gets to say this is my favorite album of the week and it's something that as a, a big music fan i will always go and read those and it was part of the buying experience and i think it's gonna be very very hard for hmv to replicate that within the own sort of your big mega stores because it they expand so much you know every time you go into hmv now it feels like there's more sets of headphones and ipads than there are actually cds uh-huh. um and one of the things I think from reading the press release that you link through to in the notes um, is that the, the guy mentions a focus on merchandise. Right. And obviously that must be great news for a lot of record labels and artists and managers because it will be so profitable. So it will be interesting yeah. to see whether it's gonna, it goes beyond just your posters, T-shirts, plectrums and tea mugs yeah. to something a little bit more unique and the deluxe box sets and signed, you know, signed things and... It, it will be interesting to see what they do, and I'm, I think I, I'm not sure whether anyone else has seen this, but I saw a, a tweet last week of the new front of Oxford, the Oxford, uh, Oxford Street branch. Yeah, I passed by there today, actually. And I, th- I think, am I right in thinking that they've made it look very, very retro, like the '60s front, and it's completely changed. A bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and to me, you know, just things like that, very small things, it it reinvigorates the brand slightly more of the old school HMV of being very much focused on music. Yeah. Um, but it will be very, very interesting to see what he does and yeah. and what whether the FOP stores go sort of more commercial in this sort of realignment of the brand or they stay very much sort of autonomous stores themselves. Yeah, uh, Emmanuel, it's uh, one of the points that he made actually in this uh, uh, in this article was that they're planning to relaunch the digital store. I- is this madness uh, that they would still try and put money into launching their own digital music store when there are so many options out there and? And downloads well, there, really there are, are not increasing that much? There are not many uh, examples of uh, bricks and mortar retailers being successful at setting up a, um, an online music store. So that's why you know, they have the brand. Will that drive traffic? I have no idea. Uh, you know, it's an interesting thing that it's, it's almost only in the UK where people can get excited about uh, retailers in music, you know, getting, you know, wow, opening new stores and so on, you know. In the U.S., it's a dead zone. I passed by on Sunset Boulevard yesterday uh, what, in front of what used to be that fantastic town record store. Yeah. And now it's a closing store. The only record store you can find in, in, of, of interest that you can find in Los Angeles or in San Francisco is Amoeba. Amoeba. Yeah, Amoeba yeah, which is that right. huge warehouse where you have absolutely everything. But other than that, all the record stores are dead. So it is, it's very British, I think, to, to think that there is still a future in, <laughs> in music retailing. And I, I, I welcome the changes because I think going to HMV was probably one of the most depressing experiences as a consumer. <laughs> yeah. it was, it, whereas you would go to FOP and yes, it was, there was life in FOP, whereas... Yeah. Mm. You know, you couldn't feel any life at HMV. Yeah, exactly. um, Virgin at some point had had life, and when you know they they went into whatever it was called Zavi or whatever, it started <laughs> looking like dead stores, and yeah, no yeah. wonder why. You know, six months later they were dead. So I really hope they will get that the aspect right, which is you know to drive consumers into the stores and make it exciting. Uh, you know, buying merchandising, why not? You know, I hope that. You know, the, what, what you want in a, in a record store is also the, the depth of the repertoire and, and also knowledge. You know, if you yeah. tap on somebody's shoulder, you want and say, you know, can I find this or that? You don't want a the answer. You want the real answer. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, also so we'll like, um, yeah, on the merchandising side, it's also interesting to, to see the psychology of like why people buy merchandise and when they buy it. Uh, I think there's a big element of emotion when it comes to merchandise, which has to serve uh, uh, a particular moment in in time for the listener so whether it's uh, them just checking out the latest album or whether it's them just coming out of a gig and being prepared to spend that 20 25 pounds on a t-shirt i'm not sure whether people would just walk in a in a brick and mortar store and buy random merchandise without you know a reason for it i mean maybe some people will but i just can't see it being this huge market i don't know mm. I think it's got to be competitively priced. I yeah. think the, the thing that I really noticed with HMV, it was getting quite ridiculous to buy a CD from a HMV store because it was so expensive. So um, the main thing will be their pricing. And as you know, as Emmanuel says, it's harder and harder to run a record store nowadays with the, you know, Amazon and all the competitors. So uh, how long is it going to last, I think, is the, or how well will they do initially and can they sustain the growth and the progression? 
absolutely it's quite fun but yeah let's move from a brick and mortar store to to a uh, uh, a digital subscription service in the US. So I want to talk about Move Music and uh, last week Billboard uh, and Glenn Peoples uh, wrote a piece uh, reporting that the Move Music announced reaching 2 million subscribers in the US. So we hadn't had an update uh, uh, on uh, uh, Spotify for a long time for example so we don't really know how many subscribers they have in the US uh, uh, but uh, as things stand, I mean given the numbers that we have, uh, Move Music has now become the largest uh, subscription services uh, service in the United States which is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, the cost of the service of course is built into the plan so uh, I think it starts at $55 per month uh, and uh, the consumers don't really feel uh, that they're paying for music and uh, uh, you know the real interesting development is that of course uh, Cricket and Move Music, music have been acquired by AT&T so we're gonna see what happens on that front uh, but you know it just feels like Move Music is making real strides in the States as much as people were dismissing it as, as a cheap option. Uh, why do you think this is really working and you know when Services like comes with music failed, for example, and uh, where do you think that leaves uh, Spotify as uh, and audio and and those uh, higher price services uh, as competitors, uh, Emmanuel? Wow, too many questions. Too many questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Always. Uh, I I don't. Two million is is a lot and is not much when you you know it's a three hundred million you know people's market. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the the biggest subscription uh, radio business still remains uh, Sirius XM, you know, right, through yeah. satellite. So I was talking uh, about on and demand, then, I guess. And, yeah. uh, and, and we're we're talking about tens of millions of people. Uh, so I, I think you have to put it into you know into into some sort of uh, scale. Thing. Yeah. I you know there's probably one thing that they got right is you know the pricing point versus you know the uh, the the value that the people put in it that's one thing um you have to remember it, not all bundles work well uh, we had news this week for example that uh orange and deezer might uh, stop having uh, that the bundle in France. All oh, right, I hadn't, uh, hadn't read that. And so you know, the, I don't know exactly why the reasons are, but you know, you, there's, the, there's, it's it's a complicated relationship between uh, always completely complicated when you have you know uh, suppliers of music and 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 networks like like AT and T. Um, yeah. You know, they don't necessarily see eye to eye with the goals, the end goals. And uh, so let's see how long that you know that that can work. Yeah, absolutely, Robert. You, you covered the music. You know, comes with music quite a lot. of music ally. I don't know if you you were already there at the time, but uh, uh, you know, it's it's not a much dissimilar proposition, really. So uh, one is one is has to wonder like why is this working and that didn't work at all. I think um, you know I know bits and bobs of, of uh, move music. I wouldn't say I'm an expert of on understanding what it is, but I think the Maybe the target audience is slightly different in uh, the U.S. I think it's generally focused. At, you know, it's a very attractive price point. Where when Nokia comes to music, I think it was, I remember it's been quite expensive. Um, I think what's interesting, you know, looking at the the stats, is that ch churn hasn't decreased. It's actually increased. You know, from the from what you looked at on Billboard reported on. Yeah. So um, I think it's quite. You know, however. ARPU has increased. So although yeah. the revenue per user is increasing, they're actually losing more customers. I'm sure that's not because of Move Music, but it, it sort yeah. of makes you wonder, especially with sort of the uh, Deezer and Orange deal as well in, in France. And, and I, I remember there was, a, I suppose, the Vodafone and Spotify deal yeah. in the UK. You know, are telecommunication companies still thinking that music is maybe as relevant as it is and is it really that sort of uh, key driver to keep people yeah. on their network? Um, but the other thing I think that sort of stands out is, is it 2 million people or is it 2 million people, sorry, is it 2 million people that have moved music or is it 2 million people that are just subscribed to the network? And I think it's interesting that they say, I think it's 55% of Muse, move music subscribers access it each month. Right. So only, you know, does, does that mean, does it actually have 1.1 million active subscribers out of the two million or is the actual number larger um, yeah. and i'm sure spotify probably has three times you know if it's if it's 1.1 million active users i'm sure spotify has nearly three million users now in the u.s that, that you know you'd hope so with their progression um so that was the other thing it was sort absolutely of absolutely no that makes a total sense and, and it, you know you, you, because it is a cheap 
carrier. So you're just wondering whether people are choosing those plans because they're cheap uh, for mm. data and calls and everything else as well. And the music comes with it, but you know, not everybody's going to be particularly into that. So definitely a very interesting point to make. <laughs> well, it's funny you mentioned Nokia. Uh, did you hear the news that the the inhabitants of the city of Nokia in Finland have renamed their city Microsoft? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that really made me laugh. At least they have a sense of humor in the, in the, the whole disaster that Nokia is. They, They're they just hoping that they're going to you know, let as many jobs be as possible back there because <laughs> there have already been substantial cuts which have... Uh, prompted uh, lots of startups to come out of Finland recently of developers that were let go from Nokia. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting how much of the country's economy that the company was driving as, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, just going back to uh, what Rob just said, you know, at uh, SF Music Tech, you had someone from Samsung. So inc incidentally, it seems that people at Samsung have their bonuses indexed on the number of time they can say Samsung and innovation in the same sentence. <laughs> Uh, so you had that, that person who kept on saying Samsung innovation, Samsung innovation. But aside from that, said that you know music still remains a very important driver uh, of consumers to Samsung. There's the, ha the, the the handsets on one side, but there's also the services that they can offer, yeah. and they do believe that music still has that you know pulling power that. Mm. Uh, you know, it's just, and but it's just a question of finding the right way to offer it. Yeah. If you know, the, the, it looks like the bundles are not working in a sense that people might just take it and not listen to it. But you have, you have to personalize it. You have to give some value added to it so that the consumer with the Samsung handset starts, you know, uh, using uh, some device or some service, some sort of application that is. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, provided by the by the the handset manufacturer. Samsung has got its own its own service as well. I don't know who's using it, but it, it does have its own streaming service as well. Yeah, I, funny enough, it was not mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, but that's innovation, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The one thing I would be really interested to find out is how the Vodafone promotion in the UK is going because they offer people the either access to Spotify or access to Sky Sports. So it'd be interesting to see a breakdown of out of the people that have taken that contract, how many people have decided for Spotify and how many people have to see whether, you know, what for a telecommunications company, what is the big driver are yeah. being able to access sports anywhere you go, more important than being able to access your music anywhere you go. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's pretty interesting, and I know what my answer would be. But you know, I'm I'm a yeah. very I'm a very small minority of, uh, especially being Italian. I don't follow sports, and it's just a tragedy, really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's really uh, bad. <laughs> you know, sometimes there's nothing better than your own personalization and playlist. Yeah. Uh, you know, before coming here, I filled in a, a playlist on my uh, on my iPhone with all kinds of West Coast music that I had from, you know, the 60s and so on, and driving on the roads, you know, listening to Jefferson Airplane and The Great Fool Dead nice. and The Doors <laughs> and all that. That was a great experience. I don't, I'm not sure that, you know, any streaming service would have been able to provide me with, you know, that kind of experience. So, you know, nothing beats, you know, your own playlist. I'm yeah, just imagining you drive into the West Coast listening to uh, West Coast gangster rap now, Emmanuel. <laughs> well, actually, uh, funnily enough, enough. Uh, NWA was also on the playlist. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, streaming services, uh, there was a, a slightly deeper integration between Spotify and, and Songkick that was uh, uh, revealed this week as uh, uh, Spotify started featuring uh, uh, artist uh, tour dates in the artist uh, profile pages uh, quite prominently. Uh, of course, the notifications will only come up if there is a date of that artist in the country of the user, uh, where the, the user is uh, using Spotify from. So that's at least slightly uh, geographically tailored, which is uh, which is nice. And it seems like uh, you know an effective. Uh, it's, it's a small step, but it's, it's maybe more effective than many other steps into creating that link between the discovery of an artist and actually the, the user becoming more involved within that artist's career. So I, I, I like that because it's a, it's, it doesn't require a huge amount of development. It's just something that it can be, was probably easy to implement on their part as well. But uh, it just seems to go that step further in, in, in creating a bit of a relationship between the, the audience of streaming services and artists, which is the main bugbear of artists at the moment. Uh, uh, but Rob, uh, do, you, do you think that's, that's a good step for them? I think it's a, 
a great result for Songkick because yeah. whether you have the Songkick uh, app or not, you see those recommendations. So it's a great um, push for them to get into all of every user on Spotify's face, you know. But um, I think you still can't buy tickets within Songkick. Sorry, you know, within Spotify. And I think what I would love personally is to have that. You know, Spotify have my credit card details to be sent either a notification or to be listening to Bruno Mars, for example. And it appears that Bruno Mars is playing at the O2, which I think he did last night. And I then get the option to buy those tickets. I don't have to enter my credit card details. I just hit buy. I confirm whether I want to do it. And all of a sudden that, you know, huge amount of money, whether it's 50 or 60 pounds, comes out of my my bank account. Or 100 for Justin Timberlake. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I think to have that, seamless integration is would be really beneficial at the moment it's still sort of click here then get taken to another website then obviously in songkick you can't buy tickets so you are then just given a, a link of affiliate links to go and buy somewhere else and yeah. i think i really do like songkick but i do find it very frustrating when there are links to tickets and it says they're available and then all of a sudden they're not and um in some ways it provides a bad customer experience and i know i know songkick are doing lots of innovative things but it does frustrate me when 75 percent of the time when i'm trying to find tickets and it says they're available i then actually click on the event bright or ticket master or c ticket site and they are not there so i, I don't know i think it's it's great for some kick but um it's not there yet it's a very it's minor yet, detail yeah. i think yeah definitely uh so emmanuel have you what do you feel about this development do you feel like you know it will drive more people to check well, I, out potential gigs from from artists they are they're liking at the moment i i i you know by the sound of what you know what uh, rob's experience it really goes uh you know, th there was a panel at uh sf music take about streaming and one of the key things that was pointed out is that if it takes more than three clicks to get to where you want it's not going to work. It has to be really customized. You know, it, it has to be an easy experience for the consumer. So if you start, you know, uh, putting walls into something that is supposedly easy to access, uh, you're not, you're going to lose the consumers very quickly. Yeah. And and uh, and uh, as a consumer myself, I believe also that you know, if if it's made complicated, adding features is always great. Uh, especially when it's linked to the universe of music, you know, so you can have the lyrics, you can have, you know, liner notes. You know, how how often do we not get information about, you know, the songs where it's being recorded or who's the producer and so on, you know, those kind of things. But it has to come almost, you know, without us noticing as consumers. Uh, I think it was Daryl uh, Ballantyne from Lyric Fine who was saying, you know, don't don't bother doing it if it's more than three clicks. Yeah. And and I think all the, the, the streaming services have to think very, very hard about what kind of experience they want to offer to consumers and make sure that it is an easy experience. And you can have as, as many features as you want if it's not easy to find. And then once you've found it, you still have stuff to do and stuff to click and so on. Then you're going to lose your consumers. Yeah. I, I mean, I would, be, I'm, yeah, sure. sorry, Andrea. No, I, what I think would be really interesting is if, and I'm not sure whether they're going to implement this, is if I'm following Daft Punk and Daft Punk are announcing a world tour, whether I get sent a push notification 10 minutes before those tickets go on store via Spotify. And that would be something that I would love. Um, but I don't know whether they have any plans to roll that out. Sorry yeah, sure. to interrupt. No, 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 it's, it's fine. I, I was just going to say that uh, a company that's interesting because it does make it so easy to get tickets is Eventbrite. They, they announced uh, last week uh, reaching the $2 billion mark in ticket sales since they opened their doors in 2006. And, you know, uh, half a billion of that is actually just over in the last uh, six months, really, for, since March. So that's that's a huge achievement for, for a ticket company of this kind. The problem is that they're having a, a hard time, as far as I can see, breaking into the music space because there is such a monopoly on, on ticket sales. So I would love to see Eventbrite being able to break a little bit into the music market because their ticketing experience is just so much easier than anybody else's at the moment. And in the second half of the show we'll talk about the Music Business Association, the new startup Splice, the LSE paper on the creative industries and lots more. But first a short information piece recorded with this week's sponsor media law firm Sheridan's.
I'm here with Tahir Bashir, and we continue our series of segments on uh, digital service providers. So hi, Tahir, and thanks for joining. Thanks for having me on the show. And so today we're going to talk about deals. Uh, and so first of all, uh, deals between uh, digital service providers and rights holders can be very complicated, and uh, you know it can be quite a mess. So how do you start the conversation so that it doesn't hit a roadblock right away? Yeah, uh, from the digital service provider's perspective, uh, get the um, get the content owner to buy into the product itself, but the service itself. So uh, uh, I think before going into deal structures, you need to get them to understand that what you're trying to do. And then in terms of uh, speeding up that deal conversation, um, take control of the deal itself. Yeah. So uh, tell, make sure you know your own business model. Make sure that you've thought through your business model um, and uh, present them with uh, something that that perhaps works for them. You know, one thing that uh, you know I try and uh, encourage DSPs to do is to you know work from a blank sheet in yeah. terms of the deal itself. Don't try and fit your model into an already existing model because quite often that causes problems. Uh, your your deal should reflect what you do. Yeah. And so, how do you deal with uh, looking at the future? You know, of course, uh, you have to think uh, when you're making a deal both uh, of, of both potential outcomes uh, both uh, you know if, if you're a new company whether you're gonna blow up and you know how that uh, the, the terms that you are signing up to uh, scale uh, to, to a, a much larger audience mm -hmm. but also on the other end if your uh, venture doesn't go well uh, how do you deal with that and what's the potential fallout uh, from the contract so mm -hmm. how, how do you do you, do you take care of those two potential eventualities in, in your negotiation yeah I mean <sighs> It's not a level playing field when you're acting for a digital service provider because ultimately you need content yeah. and the content only comes from a certain number of sources. So in terms of how much leverage you have to control that future planning, uh, sometimes it's not in your hands. But there are things that you can do. Um, what you try and do is uh, effectively think about things like you know um, targets, yeah. work ag against targets so you have different rates until you get to that target and different rates when you get beyond that target. Um, you know, uh, uh, it, you know, from a digital service provider, this concept of upfront payments and upfront guarantees is a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. So unless you've got the funding, that's a hard thing to do. So rather than going down that route, um, being a bit more uh, uh, open to the concept of if you hit your targets then there are you know perhaps a, a bigger payment at that stage yeah. so uh, the the use of the rights is really important as well because if you future plan if future planned your service and you think where it's going ideally you try and get the rights for all those different things in reality you probably have to take baby steps first because uh, ultimately you're trying to buy the confidence of the rights holder so ultimately getting all the rights in one go at the start for minimum payment very difficult yeah. so get the rights that you need which then has a knock-on impact on what you have to pay and then build on that but build in things like review periods discussions on potential uses into your deal so that it's in the mindset of the rights holder that you know you're going to come back to the table to discuss these other initiatives of course well thank you very much and until the next segment thank you very much uh, next thing I want to talk about uh, was New Zealand uh, and uh, Emmanuel I wanted to get you involved in this uh, actually because uh, it's all about uh, I'm rights. not there <laughs> <laughs> well no uh, it's all about uh, sort of licensing approaches so uh, uh, you know you've covered a lot of uh, uh, sort of societies and, and how things work uh, around that, that area and uh, uh, New Zealand has announced a new approach towards licensing for public performances so APRA which is the Austral Australasian Performing Rights Association and PPNZ which is a division of the Recorded Music in New Zealand uh, that administers the public performance uh, rights for recording artists and labels have announced the launch of One Music which is uh, essentially uh, an aggregation of the two services uh, we could, you, you can find the website on onemusicnz.com and the project uh, aims to bring together the two societies to offer a one-stop shop to get a license for public uh, performance uh, that will enable shops or wherever businesses that are playing music there uh, to just get one license super easy just get on the website find what they need to do get a license and get out uh, so it, si it simplifies the whole process significantly really and uh, in the UK I think it's still the case that you have to get a, a PRS and a PPL license separately uh, mm -hmm. there's no way of get getting those together so uh, I'm just you know it seems like a very Sens sensible move to make it makes absolute sense uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether other societies are going to take the cue and start thinking about an integrated solution of this of this kind as well Emmanuel what are your thoughts on this well it's common sense uh, you have 
performing rights for recordings and you have performing rights for publishing. Yeah. And you have two different sets of societies that are collecting and distributing to rights owners, you know, the, the proceeds of that. Uh, performing the performance right uh, it's common sense to put them together under one single uh, operating banner yeah. I think the two societies will remain autonomous, they have their own uh, way of working and so on it's probably easier to set up in a country like New Zealand, what will be interesting and the test, because it's the same players uh, when they will introduce that in Australia then that will be uh, you know, um, at a, a bigger, far bigger st scale, much more repertoire and so on, so uh, I think that that's the, uh, that's the way it should be, and that's probably where you know you will see more and more. You you know one of the trends that you see these days is licensing hubs, and so you you have the the, the, the one big licensing hub that is, is in the making currently in the UK, but you have in other regions of the world a lot of societies getting together either on the, the you know the, the, the author's right side or on the neighboring right side to offer that and then combining also author's rights and neighboring rights so i think that's the sense of history that that's the way it should be, it, it should go the problem these days uh in countries like the us is that you have introduced uh, there's an, another level of uh, fragmentation of rights in the sense that the publishers have withdrawn rights from the performing societies, ASCAP and BMI, to make direct deals with the platforms. So, Although they can't uh, anymore. <laughs> so so you, cl you, you complexify the game a yeah. little bit more when actually you should simplify it. Yeah. But I think that there are, there are reasons there. You know, one of the main reasons is that you know, uh, the performance rights in the, for the publishing side are set up. It's a statutory rate which is set by a tribunal, whereas uh, the, uh, the, the performance rights for, for, for record, sound recordings is, is, a, is a different uh, animal. So you, you have the, uh, it, it's, I think it's going to happen more and more. Uh, I would love to see PRS and PPL offering something. I know they're working on, on, on their back office, so you know maybe at, at some point they will be the, the, the front end also, and it makes no sense to send twice you know, a guy to collect you know, performance rights for PRS on one side and another guy to send for PPL. You yeah, know? exactly, so it's the money, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Rob, uh, on a UK perspective, do, do, can you see something like that happening here as well? I think, um, obviously, like Emmanuel said, the PRS are working on many projects at the moment, you know, with the global repertoire database as right. well, which, which seems like one of the most exciting things, if licensing can be exciting um, in Europe. Um, <laughs> but I think anything, any move, I think, you know, what Emmanuel says about New Zealand and, and how small it is and, you know, the volume of shops and places that will want this license will probably be relatively small to somewhere like Australia or, or elsewhere around the world. Um, I would, I think the most important thing from my point of view really is the education around why people need the license. And yeah. in the UK, it is even for someone, you know, has, who has studied the music industry, it still confuses me when I look on the PPL website and the PRS website and do you need one? Do you need the both? You know, so it's that education around just saying all you need is one. Um, and hopefully it will mean that more stores then purchase that license and, you know, in revenues increase because of that. Yeah, definitely. I mean that uh, we know that there's a, a, a huge amount of stores that uh, play music and d don't have licenses at this point, and you know part of it is financials, and part of it is also probably the complexity of of the mm. process itself. So, so it's, it's pretty interesting. And uh, uh, I just want to jump into something a bit more sexy, just because we've been talking about societies for a while. And uh, I had a story on Narm, but I'm gonna just mention it later because it's just too much at the moment. And uh, there's a new startup uh, called Splice that has been unveiled uh, this week. It started by the group me co-founder Steve Martocci with the former Living Social and Sony PlayStation engineer uh, Matt Imonetti. Uh, the company is a music collaboration app uh, that uh, aims to take the frustration out of the process of uh, collaborating with other musicians uh, uh, through the various platforms that musicians use, including Logic. Uh, Ableton and, uh, and uh, Cubase and all sorts of platforms uh, uh, but the problem is that I don't know how it works I mean it's got a private beta at the moment I haven't managed to access it yet uh, uh, all we know is that they are focusing on this vertical of uh, collaborating uh, on 
uh, allowing collaboration and making it easier on specific systems. Uh, they also have $2.75 million in funding, which have been provided by a slew of uh, uh, venture capitals uh, led by U Union Square Ventures, uh, True Ventures, Lero Ventures, and with a few other angels uh, uh, attached. Uh, so it's it's interesting. I mean, music collaboration is still a bit of a pain in the neck, really. There's a few startups that are trying to solve that, that particular issue. SoundCloud is only good for the end part of the process where you're actually ready to share a track or a stem or something with somebody for a collaboration. But the, in, in, within the actual process, if you're trying to collaborate on a project where somebody has to change a filter or do a bit of mixing or do a bit of that, it just it, it is very difficult. Uh, uh, Rob, do, do you think there is a big enough market for a startup to focus solely on this? Uh, uh, I mean, there are millions of people using these platforms. It's just whether there's millions of people that want to collaborate through them, right? In a word, no. Um, you know, personally, you know, I write music myself. I've, I've you know, studied music production and, and so on. And yeah, same. I think with, with the integrations of SoundCloud as well, is, I think is it Logic 10 or Logic 9 that you can automatically post content and share content and make it yeah. semi-collaborative? Um, I think there are too many big players already existing. You know, I, I'm sure some people must believe in the idea if they've had, you know, 3.7 five million dollars worth of funding but i think it's a very very hard space to enter and there's also so many competitors already around and yeah music ally is obviously heavily involved in the the medem startup lab and we see lots and lots of different applications each year and i, I don't think we have sort of yet seen um one that has has really knocked us out yeah. um and obviously that is why there is there isn't just a monopoly of of, of this but you know, I'll be completely honest with you. I haven't heard of of Splice. I I know as much as you just told me, Andrea. So, yeah. um, it could look utterly fantastic, and I yeah. may change my mind in in fifteen minutes if I can get an access to beta. So, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I've just I've just uh, asked for access, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, that's my I'll, disclaimer. I'll follow up on that in, uh, in the next few weeks if I do get access. But it just sounds like a hugely complex engineering challenge to try and create something that works across a variety of different systems. It's just wow. I can't imagine how that would work unless it's based on some sort of MIDI interaction or I, I, I'm really not sure. Uh, Emmanuel, do, do you feel like there well, is... Wasn't that the whole point of Windows that, you know, actually it was supposed to work on different platforms and actually <laughs> didn't really succeed in, in any, in any uh, on in... any. Uh, <laughs> I, I, so. I, I, I will probably uh, refrain from making any judgment yeah, at this stage sure. because I haven't, I haven't really uh, <laughs> looked into it. Yeah. Seen in neither the beta nor, you know, so, but uh, I, uh, I, what one interesting uh, conversation that was that took place at at Music Tech was with uh, venture capitalists, and why do they invest in certain projects? Right, <laughs> and the, and most of the answer was we don't invest in projects because a you know they might be too complicated, b there might be uh, too many licenses, and c uh, they're difficult to scale up. Yeah. Uh, so there are, you know, and that probably it's a project that falls in between. Uh, that you know you, you you have to you have to get it right. But then you know how you know how do you monetize that? Where do you where do you take the where, where are the streams going to come from? Yeah. And and from a venture capitalist, I, I'm I'm sure that's that's one that sounds like a, a really complicated one to make uh, to make uh, to make it to make work. So uh, good luck to them. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting though, because like we've seen the, the type of firms that are involved, and it's just uh, it's, it's. I think that that's part of the intrigue. I guess uh, I want to see. I want to see what the product is like. Uh, but no, I'll definitely let's move on because uh, we don't know much more about this story anyway. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, brief uh, slash paper uh, uh, released by the London School of Economics uh, this week called <laughs> Copyright and Creation. Oh, that's cool, right? Oh, I'm choking. Uh, <laughs> So, just the mention of that thing. <laughs> just the mention of the paper. So the paper is called The Copyright and Creation, A Case for Promotive Inclusing Online Sharing. And it was bound to stir a bit of controversy as it states a couple of points uh, very clearly. Uh, for, for example, one of them being that, uh, uh, according to the authors, the creative industries are innovating to adapt to a change in digital culture and evidence does not support claims about overall revenue reduction due to individual copyright infringement. So meaning that, uh, according to them, piracy has not had an adverse effect on the creative 
respective industries. It also states it in its key message that the experiences of other countries that have implemented punitive measures against individual online copyright infringers indicate that the approach does not have uh, the impact claimed by some of the creative industries. And so, uh, and so it, it calls for uh, changes also to the uh, UK Digital Economy Act of 2010, which apparently, from what I understood, if I understood correctly, is going to go into play in 2015 uh, and does include some of these uh, anti-piracy measures within that as well. Uh, they call for the government to review that because they don't think that's effective. And uh, and so that's that's an interesting, uh, you know, they, the paper is quite long. It's 18 pages long, so there's no way we're going to be able to discuss the whole paper here. We just have to go in broad strokes, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, it's still controversy. There were lots of articles on this. Uh, 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 Nigel Godric uh, from Atoms for Peace, who has been very vocal about digital issues in the last uh, few weeks, uh, also tweeted about it, saying that he is not uh, in agreement with it and that uh, piracy has decimated the music industry. Uh, it's it's an interesting paper. I mean, it does present figures in a, in a very uh, from a very different angle from what we're, that, we're that's used the problem, to. Andrea, Andrea, yeah. the real problem is it, it it has the brand LSE on it. That's right, London School of Economics. The problem is I did not find. The, the evidence, the data, I thought they were going to crunch data and offer something, and they don't. And it's, it's one of the, uh, it's, it's almost in, you know, insulting intelligence by saying, okay, you just compile two or three, you know, from three, two or three different sources, you put that into a graph, and suddenly you draw conclusions. I am really right. sorry. You know, I, I do reports like that. I, I wouldn't even call that a report. I think it's, it's, an in, it's a paper. Uh, and I, I and I, I think it's a badly informed paper. That's the problem. I, I I'm ready to discuss stuff when data or, or the research has been done, you know, in a, in a in a thorough way. That's it has not been the case here. And so then you can draw any conclusions you want. If it fits your you you know the end result that you want to achieve, then you put whatever you want into that. Uh, you know, and it, it it does not it it it's not easy to have the, then a, a discussion because suddenly the you know. The, the 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 foundations of the report are flowed from the start. So that's 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 the main grudge I have against them. And you know, then we can discuss you know about the sex of angels if we want to. <laughs> No, you're right. You're right. I mean, the LSE brand is is uh, is really what what has caused all this, and the fact that also it's been sent to a bunch of MPs as as an actual official recommendation from the LSE. Uh, Rob, did you did you get a chance to see any of these points? And and uh, uh, you know, how do you feel the LSE places itself in the in this debate? Um, I am not going. I'm going to have to withhold any judgment because <laughs> I have literally scanned it, and I think uh, what Emmanuel says, I think I. From just scanning it earlier today, I think I probably agree. Yeah. Um, There's a few graphs that have been taken from the IFPI's results and just blotted together into like a into some sort of like overall graph of music industry figures. But yeah, it's it's by no means comprehensive. I think uh, you know what I find interesting about the the link in the the notes that you'll be sharing is it's hosted by Torrent Freak. Um, so I don't know whether Torrent Freak have actually had any involvement in it, which may explain maybe some of the the pro piracy thoughts from what Emmanuel has been describing or, or what you described, Andrea. Um, but I don't know, if, obviously, if Torrent Freak has been involved, it's, it's quite scary for the LSE to take such a, uh, a biased view. But uh, apart from that, you know, I can't make anything else, I'm afraid. No, exactly. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's interesting. And uh, I, I, will, I will just point to the direct, you know, there's, there's uh, Mark Mulligan on his blog wrote yeah. something very intelligent about the, 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 the whole thing and being, and, 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 and you can trust Mark for being, you know, quite uh, thorough and, 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 you know, he's been a researcher for a long time. So uh, I think he, what he, the points he raises in his, uh, on his blog are, you know, I fully subscribe to them. So I would, I would invite uh, people to go there on Mark Mulligan's blog and, and, and check what he has, what he, what he has said. Yeah. I think that's the best. Absolutely. That's great. And uh, uh, I want to pick a last story to end on, I guess. I mean, we talk about Asif Music Tech quite a bit to Emmanuel anyway, so I guess we can, we've, we've uh, illustrated some of the things that have been addressed uh, at the conference. Uh, there was one story which is a bit convoluted just because uh, uh, people are not really that aware of these organizations, but I, I want to try and crack it anyway. So yesterday it was announced that the NARM, which is a National Association of Recording Merchandisers and DigitalMusic.org have been rebranded as a music business association and housed under the website MusicBiz.org to reflect the blurring lines between the physical and digital market these days. So there's no point having two organizations that are working alongside on those two sectors. So. Uh, 
First of all, I guess like the question to address is what is NARM? So NARM is a is a organization that uh, serves uh, music. This is from Wikipedia, by the way. I couldn't make a definition off the top of my head, to be honest. Uh, it serves music retailing businesses in lobbying and trade promotion, and uh, it includes the retailers, wholesalers, distributors, record labels, multimedia suppliers, and the whole chain essentially. Uh, and uh, and so uh, Emmanuel, I guess you are probably you know most aware of what these companies do from your end. Uh, uh, do you feel like this rebrand is uh, into uh, the uh, musicbiz.org website is something that was uh, overdue and uh, does it have any effects whatsoever on the operational side for these uh, two organizations? I, I think it's just a reflection of the way NARM has been evolving, you know, by, yeah. uh, you know, including more and more digital platforms and so on. And they've been very, very active working with the digital environment and not simply being a bricks and mortar. You know, NARM is uh, or uh, was probably the, the, the most important trade organization in the U.S. because it did represent thousands and thousands of record stores and right. the big merchandisers of records and so on. And they had a yearly convention and if you look at the literature from, you know, the people who write about the music industry in the 60s and the 70s, there's always fantastic stories about the NARM convention. You know, a record company could splash a million dollars, two million dollars at NARM to uh, introduce their new acts and the new releases to the, the, the retailers. That's no longer the case because retailers right. do not have you know, the, the same power in reaching the consumers that they had in the past. But NAM as an organization is a, has become a, a more and more inclusive organization with all the digital platforms. And I've been following what they've been doing for, for a while and I, I thought, you know, actually when they, they announced it, I thought, well, I thought that they had already done it, you know, in Beats, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, I think it's just uh, recognizing the changes that have been taking place. Uh, you know, they do organize on East, the East Coast and the West Coast, they do organize digital seminars that are extremely interesting, yeah. very well attended, with very uh, interesting speakers. So, you know, they, they have all that educational aspect that they're working on. So I think it, it is one of those organizations in the U.S. that not many people know about outside of the U.S., but I think they are very important for the ecosystem, and, and I yeah. really welcome the, the changes. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I myself, I mean, I've, I've, heard, I've read a few stories about NARM in the past, and uh, but I, I, I'm not really aware to the full, of the full extent. And I met the guys from the digitalmusic.org, uh, South by Southwest, but I'm not really aware of the full extent of their activities, to be honest. Uh, so it's great to hear a bit of a feedback on, on what they've been doing and what they might be doing in the future. And uh, Rob, I just wanted to finish with a passing comment from you on the fact that Bloomberg reported this week on iTunes Radio being potentially poised to launch in the UK at the beginning of uh, uh, 2014. Apparently, this is because uh, uh, Apple has been managing to do uh, international deals with the labels uh, as opposed to uh, Pandora that is completely reliant on the compulsory license in the US and so finds it a lot harder to move into new territories. Uh, uh, do you feel like uh, it's feasible that labels would have granted Apple a multi-territorial multi deal uh, when they started doing this iTunes radio uh, thing? And uh, you know, are you looking forward to this uh, coming to the UK if the report is true? Yeah, I have no no information apart from what's public. So oh yeah, we're, we're just um, speculating but, here. But obviously, <laughs> so uh, no, of course. But <laughs> my speculation would be that um, because it is Apple, they are obviously they are an extremely large organisation that the music industry relies heavily on. So yeah. you would expect that they have a generous agreement with the music industry that has been signed and, and maybe is. Um, a lot more easily, they have more, you know, more weight than Pandora do when it comes to moving internationally, and yeah. they are already a global brand. They are already established in China, in you know, every every country, um, pretty much. So they have that, and they also can offer, you know, I think what 500 million credit card accounts across the world yeah. um, as of day one, as when they launch. And um, the TechCrunch article mentions that iTunes Radio already had. Within the first uh, three days, I think 5.5% of Pandora's total registered users. Yeah. What will be interesting is to see sort of how many people use iTunes Radio consistently, um, because there were similar press releases when Twitter Music was released, and everyone was saying that Twitter Music is going to be the biggest thing since sliced bread. And mm -hmm. um, at the moment, I, I think I've used Twitter Music once. I thought it was fantastic. The experience was really, really good, but I haven't revisited that. Um, that experience yeah. and the other thing is I think 
how many people actually use iTunes anymore unless it's to buy music? I'm, I'm sure I'm in the minority, but um, I'm very much a Spotify or RDO man, and I yeah. probably open my iTunes once a month or, or when I need to update the software on my iOS, um, software on my iPhone. So maybe it will pull people back into iTunes, but I'm very, very interested to see, um, because obviously the biggest selling point is it's going to be free, um, what the adoption rate is of it and whether they yeah. can be a, a large player. I think it's I think it's honestly more exciting for the international market than for the US because mm. in the US there's such an, a huge adoption of Pandora, Series XM, and all those alternatives. So it's going to be difficult to gain a huge market share on that front. I, I think, but internationally, like there's markets where downloads are still expanding. You know, there's still like a place for people to click that download button that is on iTunes Radio and go through and buy the track. Uh, mm. There's countries like even in the UK, to be honest. Aside from the BBC, there there isn't like a an established radio focused service that people can just turn on and uh, and just let let it go so uh, there's some margins of expansions internationally that i think are not quite so 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 uh, fantastic in the u.s uh, but well, last week i was in uh, in palo alto with a venture capitalist and saying that he his belief was that in 2015 iTunes Radio will be in every single territory where Apple I, operates with iTunes, and that they will have the deals in place, and they really want to have a truly global proposal, and it probably will be the only truly global uh, streaming service of its kind. So yeah. that might bring you know the scale and and all that. But I, I I agree with what you say, Rob. You know, it's okay. I still use my iTunes for a lot of things, but. Uh, yeah, I'm, we're probably in the in the in the minority, but uh, it, it's mm. they they have the brand, they have the global footprint, and as you said, they they have uh, credit card details from hundreds of millions of people, and that gives them a, a little plus that you know Pandora does not have, and and the others do not have either. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, what, what will be really interesting, um, sorry, Andrea, is no, that sure. Go ahead. It, it will be interesting to see whether they publish any rates of what the click to buy is, because um, obviously you'll be listening to music within iTunes, you'll have your credit card details there, you'll be able to purchase or pre order a record very, very easily. Um, so, will we see an increase in digital sales via iTunes because of this service? And um, that's, the, I suppose, the thing that. It's exciting to, to the prospect of earning more money, um, but also it's, it's, is it going to happen? Are they going to have that large click-through rate or conversion rate um, to actually that digital purchase? Yeah, absolutely not. That's a, that's a fair point. And uh, uh, the, the question mark, I guess, is uh, whether we're ever going to see that <laughs> unless the, unless the click-through rate is insanely good. Mm. Apple is one of those companies that probably only publishes numbers when something is insanely good to just show how good the company is. So, but it, it could also be that they have secured those international deals very quickly because it is fantastic. You know that um, I, I know nothing, but sort of it could be very interesting to see that maybe the the record companies, on the other hand, have have seen that it's converting into sales very quickly in a very effective way of doing so so they've hurried through this agreement but yeah um, and, and I iTunes have you. had uh, also some experience before launching this uh, uh, you know a couple of weeks ago uh, with the in, uh, stream, uh, album streams as well so that's also probably been an, an indication for the labels as to how powerful the iTunes brand is if they are streaming mm -hmm. an album the week before how many copies does that sell essentially yeah. Well, the word here is that Eddie Q, who's in charge of, well, you know, all the music and you know the platforms and all that, has been very, very busy yeah. meeting with a lot of people from the record companies. So um. <laughs> we need a very shrewd negotiator after after Steve Jobs. It's a it's a tough spot to 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 take uh, as far as being uh, very good at getting the best deal possible. So uh, we'll we'll see what they come up with. Uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, we'll come up to the end of the show. Uh, as usual, I want to ask you guys uh, if you have anything to plug uh, uh, for yourself or for the company you work for. Uh, and, you know, you're very welcome to. Uh, Rob, uh, starting with you. Uh, a, pl a plug, I guess. I don't know whether this is, but uh, I will be starting a new job in two weeks at uh, CrowdSearch, the tech ticketing company. Oh, great. Um, so That's personal awesome. news. Um, but yeah, that would be my short plug. Um, <laughs> and we need more startups in the ticketing field so yeah i was in new york this weekend with them uh, and it was a fantastic and informative weekend and um i'm delighted to be going there it seems like a very good place to uh, to be so um great and they're gonna uh, you're gonna be based in london still 
based based in London. Yeah. Okay. So. Cool. Great. That's awesome. Well, good to hear. Uh, Emmanuel, anything you're on that you want to plug? Uh, of course. Uh, uh, well, I can always plug my blog, Le Grand yeah. Network. Uh, there's a report from the SF Music Tech Conference. That's Absolutely, that's, le, that's and, a legrandnetwork.blogspot.com, uh, just so people know, know where to go. Thank you. And next week, uh, I will be in Paris at the MAMA Conference right. and moderating a couple of panels, including one on how to crack the US market. Ha ha. <laughs> Great. Huge task. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, uh, 45 minutes plus 50 minutes of question <laughs> that's great and uh, also next week it's uh, for the calendar uh, I guess it's uh, CMJ so uh, uh, I decided against going because it was just like too short notice and I couldn't, couldn't make it work but uh, uh, I know lots of uh, the listeners will be going to CMJ so look forward to hearing their reports of it uh, I've never actually managed to make it down there so uh, I would love to make it one of these years and uh, that's it that's it for this week uh, thanks so much guys for joining me it was absolutely a pleasure having you on and uh, uh, if you like the show do check out digitalmusictrends.com and drop me an email on contact at digitalmusictrends.com I would love to hear from you and uh, the handle on Twitter is at digimusictrends have a great week and until next time and that's all for this week I really hope you enjoyed the show check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter